Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Soldiers of Cinema podcast. With me, as always, the fantastic, the amazingly mustached, Colin McFader. Those dramatic pauses are getting much more dramatic as time goes on. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm and I'm your other host, Clark Coffee. Hey, yes, well, you yes. know, I'm just trying something new, man. You know, it's been it's no, been it's a little great. bit. It's great. It's been a little bit since we've, we've recorded, you know, and we're always talking about these like wonderfully dramatic films. I thought maybe mm-hmm. I'd just bring a little of that into the introduction. You know, I mean, experiment. It's almost the new year. You know, it's like I, we've got to ex- yeah. expand our horizons, try new things, it's perfectly live fitting. on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I like uh, it. here we are with episode number 74. And today we are going to be discussing... Colin's choice, his pick, his selection. Paul Thomas Anderson's 2017 film starring Daniel Day Lewis, Vicky Cripps, Leslie Manville, <laughs> Phantom Thread. <laughs> you can sew almost anything into the canvas of a coat. When I was a boy, I started to hide things in the linings of the garments. Things that only I knew were there. Secrets. Good morning. Will you have dinner with me? Yes. I feel as if I've been looking for you for a very long time. You look beautiful. dreams come true and I have given him what he desires most in return (laughs) every piece of me why are you not married (laughs) her arrival has cast a very long shadow she's barely looked at you this evening has she may I warn you of something My brother can feel cursed, that love is doomed for him. I don't like the fabric. Maybe one day you'll change your taste. Maybe I like my own taste. Just enough to get you into trouble. Perhaps I'm looking for trouble. Stop! There is an air of quiet death in this house. You're not cursed, you're loved by me. Stop playing this game. What game? What precisely is the nature of my game? All your rules and your clothes and all this money and everything is a game. This was an ambush. Stop. Are you sent here to ruin my evening and possibly my entire life? Stop it! Whatever you do, do it carefully. That was almost like a uh, uh, Shatner there for a second. (laughs) Hey, you know, I, 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 I've been, you know, I, I've been, you know, thinking about maybe delving into the world of performance art and, you know, Shatner is one of my, you know, minor heroes, you might say. There you uh, go. I, I remember spending many and not many, but a few like uh, evenings, moments laughing at some of his recordings with friends, you know, <laughs> when we, when we were younger and we first found out he actually had albums, you know, and they were contain these really ridiculously phrased readings and interpretations um but yeah (laughs) you know whatever well Um, imagine phantom thread starring william shatner that would be something oh god i would you know that would be amazing a dress to make (laughs) (laughs) all right so uh what a film um you know what a film let's start off um you know it's your selection Mm mm-hmm Let's start off like we always like to do with a little bit of background on our kind of, you know, our, our personal relationships mm-hmm. with the film yeah. and kind of how I'm all, like always, I mean, not to beat a dead horse, but I'm always interested in in how you've 
you you choose your selections you know being a generation younger than me it's always interesting to see what the what the hip cool kids these days are you know <laughs> are, are watching and, exactly you know. <laughs> so yeah They're watching so, anyway, movies about so, dressmakers <laughs> i'm in a mood today what can i say i'm in a mood uh but um, yeah so so why phantom thread and you know when did you first catch this flick and 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 all that good stuff yeah, well, so there's a few reasons. Like one of the, the one of the reasons that I chose it was because I fought, like I suppose recently we actually have been doing uh, a few more recent movies, but um, you no, know, I wanted to choose something contemporary. I thought that it would be interesting, you know, mm-hmm. to to discuss uh, something that that we both would have seen in theaters and that kind of had a recent okay. buzz and things like yeah. that. Even though, as you described when we were discussing this earlier, is that it's it's six years old now which i think is insane i know uh, I, I it blew me away when i was uh, you know I, it, w- when i saw that i was like in my memory it was like okay this movie's only been out for a few years right yeah <laughs> nope <laughs> um but yeah so i i saw it in theaters when it came out um i Pre-COVID. was a PGA fan beforehand so i i knew of him and i i mm-hmm. seen his movies and things like that so i kind of sure not knew what to expect in terms of that you never really know all his movies are so different from each other that it's hard to know mm-hmm. what to expect but knew what yeah. to expect on a quality front um and um really loved it at the time i i think this is a movie that i think every time i've watched it i've actually liked it more and more and more um even though i loved it when i saw it um i got to see it on 70 millimeter on a blow up mm. as well, which was great. Um, that was like a stunning way to so see it. Like movie. 70 millimeter digital or film projection? Film projection. So they did oh. a blow up because it was a 35 millimeter um, oh, okay. shot on 35. I, I but, missed uh, that when you said they blow did up. a, okay. uh, yeah, they did a blow up and um, I got to see that, which was fantastic. Um, really, I think like the best way to see this movie because it's, as we'll get into later, it's such a stunning mm. visual mm. movie as well. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it just really. Um, I don't know. I think in in terms of the point of my life that I saw this, it would have been a I would have been a year out from high school, and so I was kind of, uh, I guess it was a shifting point, and it really I think kind of s- symbolizes that in a lot of ways, and that this movie has really inspired me. It was it was a it was a moment of transition exactly in young, in young Cullen's life. I realized moved. that my my calling was in fact dressmaking in London. <laughs> um, but no, I think that it, I don't know, it really impacted and, and, me back then and still and to I this day. I can see in the background here that you know, <laughs> there's a really extraordinary examples of your work back there. Yes, uh, yes, I, I particularly exactly. like that one in, in Violet. That's extraordinary. And that mm-hmm. chartreuse one next to it is really quite yes. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I know I do, I do, um, you know, I, I, I probably sound like a broken record but yeah that's this really did inspire me it uh like i mean i i feel like in our casual conversations right like this film has come up i think almost more times than any other film i feel like yeah just just you know not here on the podcast but but just here in our kind of like casual conversations together about films over the years i mean i i do get a sense and i'm honestly surprised it's taken you this long uh, to select this for one of the episodes, but but yeah, I mean, I totally not surprised when you picked it. I've been waiting for it, mm-hmm. um, and I mean, yeah, it wasn't it's... mannequin, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside joke there. It's... But I do, I think the we should do mannequin it, someday. <laughs> it like to this to this day, like I remember again when I was when I was writing uh, the the first feature that I actually shot. This movie was one of the things that majorly changed. The, how I wrote that movie like the yeah. before and after kind of infusing this into it it was totally different so it really has yeah like shaped a lot okay um, so it's of, a big influence a big yeah. inspiration you saw it at the theater like on its first run now has this been a film that you've watched many times after that or I think this is probably my fourth or fifth time seeing fourth it or fifth. so it hasn't okay. been like a like yeah. an obsession in that sense but i i do go back to it you know probably once a year yeah. on average and now and now in your rest like for, for in your personal subjective opinion is this pta's best film i think so i okay. do think so and i like most of his movies um some of one i can take or leave it but i think that like most of his run i i, I love and okay uh, but this i think is is my favorite of his yeah okay all right you All know, right. So, it, what about you? What about you? So, What's your story? <laughs> so, this is actually so. This is interesting. I, I and as much as I'm a fan of theaters and the theatrical experience, I do have to admit I did not see this film in the theater. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah, I did not. Um, so I, I did see Inherent Vice, and I saw that in '70 in LA, 
And I was split on that or torn on that one, I guess, a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, on subsequent viewings, I have my uh, admiration for that film has grown or, you know, uh, but on its first f- viewing, I was a little bit mm, kind of scratching my head mm-hmm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that that really played any role in me not seeing Phantom Thread at the theater. It wasn't like, oh, gosh, PTA has just gone downhill. I'm never mm-hmm. going to watch another one of his films. I can't remember now, six years ago, why I didn't. I don't know if it was a scheduling thing. I don't know. You know I don't know what it was. But I didn't go see it at the theater. And, and I didn't, you know, so I saw it at home. Um, and uh but the but the experience was still pretty decent i i i think i was able to see it in uhd and Mm -hmm. you know pretty decent screen and uh and you know my first viewing it was i think i was so kind of focused on the visuals it was it was such a beautiful film that i almost feel like it (laughs) it almost took me out Mm-hmm. Of the st- I don't, but this is just, boy, I, I am not saying that that's like a fault of the film. Like, I think I just, in my kind of, I, I kind of like went technical on it. And yeah. I was like, how yeah, they no, do I this? I understand how-? that. And, and, uh, and, and I was kind of so mesmerized with the look of the film and the quality of the cinematography and kind of figuring out how do they do this. Um, and really, I, I, I guess I just kind of got a little too much into the study of the composition and lighting mm-hmm. and, um, I did. I, I wasn't hugely emotionally impacted by the f- actual s- the, the film itself, the story right. itself. Right. Um, and so it did. It, it didn't have a big impact on me. Um, but in subsequent viewings, and especially in this last one, I've I've been able to kind of put all that stuff aside. I've already kind of been there, done that. Of you know, s- like thought about all those things, and just kind of focus on the performances and the story, what's going on. And I have to say, this last viewing, I just watched it last night in preparation for this discussion, I, I enjoyed the film more than I have in any of the other previous previous two or three or four viewings. Mm-hmm. Um, now, how long much, has it been for you since you last saw it? I, I want to say probably two, three years. Yeah, and actually, I think it's the same for me. I think I think it's been since at least before I made uh, Daylight Again, that I had I, last mm. time I saw this. So it, it's yeah. been quite a bit of time for me, too, about two and a half years. Yeah, and interestingly, you know, in the, in the interim, right? So since so since uh, so in those two or three years since I've seen it last, I have gone back and seen a couple of his other films again. Like I mm-hmm. recently saw Boogie Nights again, um, The Master. Uh, I think I even might have watched Inherent Vice again at home. Um, I think Hard Eight. I might have even seen actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, not Magnolia, not Punch Drunk Love, not There Will Be Blood. I've seen There Will Be Blood, you know, four or five times probably. Um, so I've even gone back, and I, obviously I saw Licorice Pizza, right, as it was released uh, mm-hmm. after Phantom Thread. So I've, you know, so I've kind of uh, seen a few of his films in the interim, you know, in between the, you know, uh, this viewing now and my previous viewing of Phantom Thread. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I, it, it hit me on a different level this time. I focused much more just on the story, the emotional content of the film, and, you know, spent more time kind of thinking about, you know, at least kind of from my perspective, like what what might have this film film meant to Paul Thomas Anderson? What might have inspired him mm-hmm. to write this and to make this film? Um, it's clearly made as meticulously as uh, Daniel Day-Lewis's Woodcock character's dresses, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it's hard not to thematically kind of go down that path of drawing parallels to, you know, maybe PTA as an artist, Woodcock as an artist, um, what it means to be in a relationship uh, and how how does a person kind of navigate their artistic obsessions and having space for relationships and in their life and these kind of things. So that all of that spoke to me. It took it consumed much more of my experience viewing this time around than before. Mm-hmm. which I'm grateful for, which I'm grateful for, um, because it was a really great experience. I really enjoyed watching. And of course it was just as beautiful. It's not like that. It's not like any of that was gone. I just like soaked it up. I, you know, I was like, it, 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 I, I want to get, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but geez, I mean, I'm pissed off. I, I'm seriously pissed off. I'm, I'm mad. That is unfair. It's totally unfair. I'm going to be a 12 year old child right now. <laughs> it is unfair that Paul Thomas Anderson can be such a good writer 
such a good director and such a good cinematographer. It is mm-hmm. just, it's just not right. It's not mm-hmm. right. It's not right. You could be good at one of those things. Maybe two. <laughs> Maybe two. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe two. But it is totally now. Now, now, if he releases his next film and he stars in it, oh god, yeah, imagine. And, and he's and, never and, done a and, cameo, so who knows? <laughs> and crushes it. I, it's over. I quit. I'm. I'm. I'm selling my gear. I'm. I'm hanging it up. I'm done. I'm done. I do think it's it's sort of interesting because you you sort of mentioned though that your first time, um, you might have been a bit hung up on kind of just like. The, the technical aspects of this movie are over, overwhelming in sort of a it's strange way. It's overwhelming, man. That it's not it, like, a, you know, there's probably no visual effects in this movie at all, but but it's not like in that sense where you're like, oh my God, there's just so much No, it's a composition. It's, it's a it's, composition. It's, it's exactly. It's, and I think what's interesting about it is that this is also a movie that I've tried to dig up like every little bit of information on because, you know, mm. the Blu-ray doesn't have very many extras. It's got some camera tests that are narrated by pta and then mm-hmm. it has um some deleted scenes and then there's like a slideshow of of behind the scenes images okay. and so every bit of kind of uh you know tertiary information i i know about this movie is all from just kind of digging online and things like that mm. there's this really really great video that i um spoke to you about uh with the lighting cameraman mike bauman um, where he kind of goes through with well, and uh, let's the... let's tell people what that is. So it's called yeah, Light, so... Lighting Phantom Thread, yeah, uh, and it's on Lux it's on YouTube yeah. Lighting's YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and just you know Google or Google or search in YouTube Lighting Phantom Thread, you'll find it. Now I have not seen it yet. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna watch it like tonight probably. You just yeah, mentioned it's, it, like a, yeah it's, it's like it's like a two and a half hour yep. like basically talk with the lighting cameraman the um first or second ac i think it's the first ac actually and Mm -hmm. the uh gaffer of the film and they go into great detail as we will in this episode too about the process of like because there's no credited cinematographer um you know how that worked how did pta kind of go about crafting the visual look of this um and kind of have a little bit more in a strange way like egalitarian kind of group effort work on the cinematography as, as opposed to having like a, a dedicated DP mm. um, as he has in all of his previous work. Um, and then of course he did the same thing on Licorice Pizza. But I, I think but, that, yeah, so that's one of the things that's really but interesting now, about but the now, movies. But, but PTA did a substantial amount of this work, right? Oh yes. Yeah, absolutely. He was definitely, uh, yeah. you know, the, and, the and working leader in the of UK, the ship in that sense, since, captain since of the, the ship. But. Since it was a UK production, they shot in the UK, he was mm-hmm. able to go without accredited DP, is my understanding. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because, of course, the union rules would not allow that if they were to have shot in the United States. Yeah, so Mike Bauman, who was the lighting cameraman for this, was also the same role, like, same logistical role on mm. uh, Licorice Pizza, but was credited as the cinematographer yeah. just because of the... By requirement. Um, yeah. yeah, the ASC rules and things like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so like I think that it's, that's another interesting thing about, though, about covering a contemporary movie, too, is that you've got contemporary, like, like primary sources to kind of pull from. Not that, you know, you can't listen to Toby Hooper talk about uh, Texas Chainsaw or something like that, but it's interesting mm-hmm. to have been able to kind of witness the the, like making of this and people talking about it and sort of be involved in that kind of cultural conversation as the movie came out um and to be able to dig up these pieces of information as they are literally coming out and as Mm -hmm. they're being spoken about is is Mm -hmm. something that's a little bit fun um yeah but yeah i mean let's perhaps yeah you know i i just want to yeah uh (laughs) sorry well yeah we'll back up a little bit before we get like too too far Mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. these like technical rabbit holes but um, you know, from a story perspective, so we'll kind of like start, you know, at, at the top and kind of go down a little bit. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, hopefully, if you're listening to this, you you have seen the film at least once. That would make a lot of sense. It would be super mm-hmm. weird if you were <laughs> listening to this and you hadn't seen it. Although, hey, I'm down for super weird. Do whatever floats your boat, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have an extremely simple story, and I mean, uh, so much so that I think or at least. Uh, simple in its kind of mechanizations, right? It's kind of boy meets girl. Um, they have this, they develop a relationship and it's kind of a muse, romantic kind of relationship. And we've, we have, you know, as the status quo is established in the first act, we can see that this is something that um, 
Daniel Day Lewis's character Woodcock, who is a dress uh, design. I don't know what would you call it. Dress, not dress designer, dress builder, dress maker. Yeah, he's like a dress. Well, he's he does like fashion. He owns a a a dressmaking house in 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 London, London. and it's clearly which is like a big fashion center. And it's clearly yeah, and it's clearly this is the height of you know uh, the wealthy and the royal Mm -hmm. come from all around uh, to have uh, one off dresses made for them. Mm -hmm. And and we and it's established that this is his this is his thing. This is what he does. He you know. meets a woman she becomes his muse uh ultimately of course he's married to his art not to her and eventually the the magic wears off he discards her and we come into this story where he has just now uh, discarded one and is meeting a new Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. yeah the opening of this movie is kind of like a a little the ending of the previous yeah the ending of the previous and and so and, and but it's interesting you know and so boy meets girl and kind of muse and it, but we can see that she's different uh mm-hmm. she is not subjugated by him so easily as perhaps some of his earlier women relationships may have been the case she gives as good as she gets and uh and then we have this this relationship kind of develops and um and this, you know, it's 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 not a whole lot from like a plot mechanization to the point where you know you were even kind of wondering, is this a three act structure film? Mm-hmm. And I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit more about why you asked that question, and we can kind of maybe debate or discuss that. But mm-hmm. you'd even you'd even wondered like, well, is is this even a third act? What is this exactly? What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I think that the the I think what, why that question kind of comes up for me is because it's so. PTA sort of talks about his writing process and this idea that the the like he said in interviews about this like the characters write the the story that that his favorite thing to do is to set two people in like a coffee shop or a restaurant and have them start talking and just follow it and you can see that sort of here you know the meeting of um, Reynolds and Alma in the mm-hmm. uh, little like cafe on the you know on the on the shore. Mm-hmm. Um, where he and so, so I think cutely that, orders like almost yes, everything a, on a the feast. menu. It's yeah, a really yeah, beautiful a scene, yeah. and all these things. Yeah, um, but I think that the the my questioning of the third, like it's certainly um, a three act structure in the sense that you can very much see the like follow the progression of the movie through three acts. However, I think where my my question kind of comes in is more that does the like it's such a character driven film. Yeah, for sure. And it's such an emotionally driven film, almost in the sense that you could, like the characterization in this movie is so strong that, and I wouldn't recommend this, but you could drop into this movie halfway into it and you would just, on the virtue of the the performances and the way that they are delivering these roles, um, you could understand motivation. And mm-hmm. it's like you almost don't need the the mechanizations of the plot Mm-mm. to understand motivation just because of how these characters are interacting in every single scene, um, the expressions that they make when they look at each other, their actions and things like that. I think it's mm-hmm. a brilliantly, brilliantly done uh, work in that sort of sense. Um, and so while, yeah, it does it does have the three act, I almost find that you kind of like forget about that. Like you almost like it kind of washes over you, which I think, you know, any good uh, screenplay should make you forget that you're, you know, watching a story that has been written by someone in that sense. Um but no, it's it just I don't know. It feels it's a hard thing to kind of uh, you know nail down into like a sentence because it, yeah. it is it's like one of those things where That's if okay. you watch the movie, you kind of feel it. Just how some things feel right and some yeah. things might not feel right. You just kind of get this this sense that like you're ex- existing with these characters and you're watching this. This well, there's clearly unfolding. an elegance, right? I mean, yeah. there's clearly there's clearly an elegance. I don't know another a better way to say it, but there's clearly mm-hmm. an elegance to how this is written, how it's performed you know how it's executed uh, and i agree with you you know it's you're right you you could come into the middle of this uh, and, and honestly you could come in almost at any point in this movie and you're definitely going to get a sense of at least you know the 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 gist of the relationship between these two characters there's no doubt i mean in every scene um mm-hmm. it's because every scene is doing so much character work Mm-hmm. Uh, the, every look, every glance, every gesture, every word is is all put into service to uh, developing the 
and illustrating their relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting that you say developing their relationship and not like it's not a movie where every single scene is about pushing the plot forward. Well, no, it's not. And 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 I would argue that most of his films aren't are are, are almost all of them. You know, know, some of his films have more plot than others, but I really do see this as a pretty uh not predictable but a a you know a, a, a fairly on target mm-hmm. subject matter or or approach or you know thematically to all of PTA's films yeah, yeah. i think all of his films are about relationships and usually there are a couple characters who you know um who are you know um who are kind of um, symbolizing like the core of that, you know, thematic discussion of what a relationship mm-hmm. is. Um, and so I, th- whether that's, you know, in the master it's, it's Joaquin and, um, oh geez, I'm Hoffman, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yes. Like they're, you know, it's kind of the L Ron Hubbard and one of mm-hmm. his students kind of vibe. I mean, it's, he does a great job of, you know, and uh, uh, there will be blood. It's Daniel Day Lewis's character and his son and also Paul the, Danos yeah yep and so i feel like he does this amazing job of bringing uh, of 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 putting these really quite not simple but elemental thematic explorations of relationships of mm-hmm. of human relationships in these very interesting ornate worlds mm-hmm. so it's like mm-hmm. the beginning of the oil rush you know, out west in the United States, or it's in London in the fifties, and there's this guy is this you know, couture dress maker, this mm-hmm. extraordinary artist at the top of his powers. Um, it, it's it, he puts it in these really interesting worlds, and there's all this fascinating stuff going on behind the scenes. But really, it's not about any of that. It's mm-hmm. not about any of that. Um, it's about these characters uh, that are at the fore of his stories. Or of these, I would almost say, of the four of these character studies. Um, and they're they're so beautifully executed that it's not, you know, I think a lot of times, right, it's like you, what's the old thing? You know, it's like you you go, like every student film that ever, ever exists, right, is like, you know, it's not about the story, man. It's about your know, character study. Yeah. And, yeah, they're, yeah. and of course, they're garbage, you know, yeah. it's crap. But but PTA really, really has nailed it. Um so so yeah you're right i mean it's not about what's happening uh per se i mean Mm -hmm. you know the the poisoning i think is you know there there are some things that are important to the story uh or you know to our understanding of the characters i mean but Mm -hmm. um you know this this uh this man's relationship to his mother and his sister and then his this romantic relationship his lover his muse um it's really about that well, and it can be difficult to talk about PTA's writing without talking about his direction because they're so intertwined, and, and all, of course he sure. does both of them. So, um, But I do think it's it's like this film is also so... it's, And I don't mean this as a knock of his other work, but I think that it is, it, in my opinion, his most mature work. Like you're, mm. you're really a long way from the kinetic... Um, Wanners in in Magnolia or in Boogie Nights, where the camera is mm-hmm. very very uh, free Kinetic. and and, and uh, it moves a lot, and and that the shots are kind of very much designed to elicit a a sense of like chaos or or very strong emotions. Whereas this is incredibly understated. It's very low key. It's very restrained. Um, it reminds me, honestly, there's a lot of of, and I think that he's been pretty clear on this as well because of course it's set in the 50s in london um very hitchcocky in a lot of ways not necessarily in like a thriller sense but in the way that most of the shots unless you're really up in a conversation but a lot of the shots are are long shots you're kind of distant from the character you're looking through a door um at characters in a room having a discussion or sitting at a table or things like that like he really Mm -hmm. allows the actors to play out these scenes kind of uninterrupted by rapid cuts or or you know really really uh, meticulous camera movement which i think mm-hmm. is really interesting because you know again you go back to his earlier work and that's kind of what he was known for like that was his staple yeah um, but to see him kind of mature in this way and evolve into a very understated very low-key kind of confident like really really confident that that you don't need to do a lot with a shot to make a powerful shot um, well, i think it's 
Yeah, I just want to add, if it's okay, um, yeah, go ahead. to that. You know, it's interesting, kind of confident, not confident. I, you know, I don't know. I think that's fair to say, but it seems to me that he's been a confident filmmaker from the get-go. Now, mm-hmm. clearly, mm-hmm. his expression of his art uh, has changed. I mean, you know, I, I feel like I see a lot of Scorsese influence in uh, that he kind of took and turned into his own thing in his first films. Like you suggest, you, you clearly have. Yeah, all I, I, Scorsese, all and, that yep, sort of thing, yeah. And, and I feel like we have, um, definitely we have a kinetic camera. And I feel like how I might define the shift, it seems to me, is that um, a little bit of a transition in focus, not a little bit, very clearly, an ob- a significant transition in focus from the movement of the camera being key to the storytelling to the composition mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. being key to the storytelling exactly and yeah. so like it's the it's the focus on on composition uh, versus movement mm-hmm. and i think both are both are awesome i mean i i don't think it diminishes his earlier work I, oh not I, at all no i yeah. i wouldn't say that his newer work is just automatically necessarily better than his old work but what is interesting is just is, is the progression Mm-hmm. Um, what is interesting is just when you when you look at an artist that's obviously um, interesting and has uh, a unique perspective and uh, is good. At started what they out do, pretty young just, too. Yeah, and started out young, and and it's just it, it is interesting to kind of see the progression of their the expression of their opinion in the medium. So mm-hmm. you know that might be how I you know I don't you know, I don't know if he's any more or less confident now than he was before, but I'm sure he's older. And he's got a lot more of life experience, and um, that. Yeah, you know. I think that he uh, he's definitely always been confident because you watch like old <laughs> interviews with him when he's making yeah, I don't think, I mean, he, are, he, and he's, he's like, clearly very very. Con- I think more what I'm maybe confident is even the right word, but more so still. Um, like you said, he's trusting in the composition mm-hmm. to do the work yeah. and to tell the story, and is has more faith in that than I think he ever has before in this and. Like I said, yeah. not not a knock at his earlier work because I love most of his earlier stuff. Um, but um, this yes. is very, very. Again, I just think it's like a very fascinating thing to look at this. It is fascinating and to look at something that he made earlier and see how you can still see a through line. Like there's certainly a mm-hmm. creative through line where you you can tell that it is the same person making these movies. Um, but just to see where his where his kind of interests lie and. Uh, what what he puts the most trust in to yeah. tell that story, um, yeah. And so well, I yeah, think, I do. I think that it's really, really. I mean, you again have brought this up a few times too, where it's like, is is this meticulously crafted story and film and this beautiful you know palette that we see that he's created, is that kind of a a like mirror image of Reynolds in this as well? Like, does the writing involve that sort of aspect? And mm. was it intentional? Was it not intentional? Because it also, I mean, it does deal with these elements of like parental issues. Like, he kind of has these like mother issue, like issues with his yeah. relationship, not in terms of like a bad relationship with the mother, but like a reliance on the mother that yeah. he needs these like strong women in his life yeah. um, for sort of some sense of direction. And he doesn't calm down until he's able to be put in this almost like infantile state mm-hmm. with the poisonings. And I find that mm. really, really fascinating. And yeah, and I think that the one thing that I'll add too is that this movie in perhaps contrast with some of his other movies, not all of them, but like uh, certainly something like um, There Will Be Blood where it's actually, despite its tone and despite that it's not overtly comedic, it's quite lighthearted in in mm. a lot of senses. Like there's it's a not, lot of humor. There's yeah, there's a lot, lot of humor, humor, and it's like the story. the The stakes are never like true life and death. The stakes mm-hmm. are never like the destruction of one's life or um, someone you know failing to be successful in where the way they want to be. It's not a movie like necessarily about that. It's more an interesting study of this this kind of man child in a lot of ways and how he. How he well, deals with, okay. His, well, how he doesn't deal with them, but how the but, women around him. But deal maybe with it them. is. But maybe it is. I'll play devil's advocate. Maybe it is. Maybe it is a study of love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe it is a study of. I don't know. So I'm figuring this out as we go. So mm-hmm. audience, bear with me. So I, and, and, <laughs> speak and your just, truth. <laughs> and as a disclaimer and as an aside, you know, Cullen and I don't uh, hone all the, you know, we don't hammer all of our ideas out on these films beforehand no, no. And, and come to the mic with notes and 
outlines and a, a prepared statement about, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to digress here for a second. You know, it's like sometimes I will, you know, in the morning I'll have my cup of coffee and I'll wake up to like a YouTube essay um, on something about cinema 99% mm -hmm. of the time. And, and then mm -hmm. that other 1% of the time will be something about cars because I also love cars. But but it'll be something about cinema. And, you know, and there are a handful of, of YouTubers out there who just, they just blow me away with these meticulously crafted, interesting uh, video essays, mm -hmm. analyses of film. And so when Colin and I do our podcast, sometimes I get so self-conscious because I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, we're improvising here. Like we're just mm -hmm. having a conversation. It's casual. I mean, we love cinema and we're filmmakers ourselves, but you know, I, I, this hasn't been meticulously crafted with like a, you know, a half a dozen support staff in the background the or anything like that. And, yeah. Not that anybody, not that anybody listening out there was ever for a second going to get, assume that we did have a support <laughs> staff by our production values here. Okay. I'm not saying that, but, um, but so, you know, a lot of times like we're finding our, like, this is like us thinking out loud. That's what's mm -hmm. happening right now. And is it, Hey, is it interesting? I, I, I hope, I don't know. Um, but that's where we're at. So, but you know, I, I mean, like, the, I, I think that's the thing that kind of affected me more this time was that, you know, because I think before that's what I kind of saw. It was like I saw a lot of the sizzle, right? Mm -hmm. It was the cinematography, the composition, the performances, and it, and, and I got and and the humor, um, and and, and it was, and, and I I feel like this time when I watched it there was more I, I was more intrigued and focused on this study of love mm -hmm. and that affected me substantially more than than kind of all those other things combined times a hundred so yeah. i don't know i mean i might argue that it actually is about something absolutely vital and i don't know how to articulate it here but there is I mean, we have a character who is obsessed with the aesthetic. He's meticulous. Mm -hmm. He's meticulous about his grooming. He's always dressed meticulously. He's he is meticulous about every aspect of his external life. Yeah, even and, to the and, food he eats, right? Like and and yeah. and and so what we what does that mean when somebody is meticulous about the externalities of their life? It it means that they are seeking control. They that's what happens, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When we when we there there is some type of there's a because it's really scary for some people to be out of control mm -hmm. to feel like they don't have control is terrifying to most people frankly and so it's easy i think to miss that because you can wrap that up in his meticulous nature of his dresses and so you're like well he's an artist so so that's just this overspill. Like, that's his personality. He's just meticulous about everything because he's an artist. But it's more than that, I think. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I, I, yeah. I think that he's meticulous because he's terrified. Mm -hmm. And so you talked uh, very, uh, like, a very wise observation, you know, that he's, he absolutely is reliant on his mother who's no longer living. This, this memory of his mother. And he even... I mean, it, this phantom thread, the very title comes from that he, he sews these little tokens mm -hmm. hidden into his clothing. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how he has her sewn into his breast mm -hmm. and his jacket, that she's always near his heart. So, so, and you also talked about how he's kind of this man child. And he is, in a sense, that he's, he's, he's living in fear. He has to control everything around him. Mm -hmm. He has his sister uh, enabling him to, to manage everything around him so that he can focus just on the aesthetic perfection of these dresses, right? Which is like the furthest extension of his, his need to control, to create mm -hmm. something perfect, right? And because of course the world isn't and life isn't and his internal mind isn't and so if he can create this one perfect thing he can transcend all of that and he can be in control he can be his own god and here comes this and and you know of course it's clear we see that he's keeping these other relationships at arm's length he's like okay to use them as a muse but once that's gone once they want to actually be a human being once mm -hmm. there's actually any kind of requirement for emotional connection or vulnerability from him, 
or, or once they have any impact in his life and, you know, it's the wrong kind of pastry in the basket for breakfast. Woo! Out mm -hmm. of here. I mm -hmm. can't deal with that. And so, so I feel like it's, it's actually this extraordinary meditation on, on the, the, the kind of vulnerability that is required for true for love to actually exist oh yeah yeah and i yeah i think that um you know i'm, I'm in complete agreement that I, I i don't think the uh when i say that the stakes aren't like world ending what i find interesting about movies like this is that it, it even though they aren't the a good filmmaker a good storyteller and good performances what they will do is they will make you feel like these things are that to him, this is this is the end of the world. Mm. That his loss of control is absolutely the end of the world, and and it is life threatening. Um, and well, but the reason, okay, hold, yeah, sorry, to, uh, yeah, this I think this is important because this ties into. So we talked about how this movie is not about plot. Mm -hmm. So a lot of films, a lot of stories will try to do this through big big plot things happening, right? Yeah. I mean, come on, yeah. we see this. It's like it's like all these Marvel movies, right? Everything is. At first, it's like, well, well, the Earth will be destroyed. Now mm -hmm. it's like the entire universe will be destroyed. Oh no, no, no. now it, it's every <laughs> dimension. It's like, oh my. So, so, and and they have it so ass backwards. Pardon my French. Mm -hmm. It's never about the externalities. It's never about the significance or the magnitude of the plot mechanizations that that give it any kind of gravity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so perfect and beautiful about this film. Is that on face value there isn't any there aren't any um, um, uh, gosh uh, there there aren't any no, there isn't anything significantly happening nothing there is nothing horrible gonna happen mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. stakes the stakes are seemingly very low the yeah. stakes I mean we're, we're talking very very low externalized stakes but within but within the nuance mm -hmm. of all of this we have the highest stakes possible actually. For, for all of us, which is, do you decide, can you allow, will you accept the, the vulnerability that is required and the chaos that much, must be accepted to allow love into your life? I, yeah, I don't know yeah. of a, I mean, I don't know of a bigger question than like, can you love and be loved? And I think that even the, the final kind of big climax, the climactic moment when he eats the, the poisoned omelet, Oh, and knowingly it's so eats the poisoned omelet. So let's back is up. This, let's back up. Oh, so Hold yeah, on. I'll, I'll, I'll Pre give set some the context scene. just um, in case. Give so some yeah, context. so I mean, essentially, uh, what what Alma has learned at this point is that the only way to get him to absolve that control and that vice grip he has over over wanting control and needing mm -hmm. control and this constant stress in his life about that is to again essentially make him into this like infant by. Was feeding to make him, him poison mushrooms to make and not him sick, yeah. to kill him, but yeah, to exactly to make him sick so that he needs care. And he, mm -hmm. in this moment, so at the the finale of the film, is is aware that she has poisoned him the first time. He's caught on. It's never externalized. He doesn't verbalize it. He doesn't confront her about it. Which, which, thank God, by the way. But I mean, oh it's yes, just exactly. So beautiful to see so much conveyed, it's just with subtlety. Look, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I mean, I just have to say this, like. We're talking about structure, you know, we kind of go back, we're saying this is a three act. And I mean, you, I think you can kind of squeeze anything into a three act. We can, because everything has a beginning, a middle, and end. That's mm -hmm. all three act really means. But, but seriously, the, in my opinion, the climax of this film, this is how subtle this is, this film is, in my opinion, how beautiful it is. Literally, the climax of this film is Daniel Day Lewis's character swallowing. Mm hmm. That's literally yeah. the climax. That is actually, I mean, and and here's the crazy thing. You know, again, I I mean, I don't want to, uh, you know, go over and over and over, but it's like you have so many of these movies and a lot of them happen to be like these Marvel movies. And it's like the climax, again, it's like, oh my God, the entire universe, multiple universes, ah, and billions and billions of sentient, whatever, alien species, we're all going to die. And the climax is garbage. I don't care. I'm totally non-emotionally involved. Yeah, I'm not bought in at all. <laughs> and here, one character simply swallows. Yeah. And it means more than all of that other stuff. Well, and I think what's so brilliant about the ending, too, is that you 
you can see in the moment how Daniel Day-Lewis plays it so, so well, oh. whereas he's cutting the omelet and he's looking Sublime. at her and he's, and he's, holding he's the fork still and clearly he's holding... doing this thing where he's like, yeah, yeah. I still want this control. I am yep. gonna have the control of putting this in my mouth and swallowing yes. it. But yes. I'm telling you that I am, I am, I am willing to, you know, I am subjugating you, myself on purpose. Yeah. I, yeah. I am going to subjugate myself to you by conscious, conscious, conscientious choice, and that yeah. is what I'm. That is, yeah, the, that's that the, is the, that's the like mission the, statement the truest of the statement of love there, because <laughs> that's what happens in love, not. Yeah. Not lust, not puppy dog, where your emotions have overtaken you and you don't have choice. This is where you are of sound mind and body and you have your wits about you and you have a choice to make. Mm-hmm. Am, I, am I going to subjugate myself to this person on some level? Because you, mm-hmm. that's what you have to do. Both yeah. people have yeah. to do that. And... Uh, that's just a, it's a beautiful theme to explore and it's so beautifully explored in this film. Yeah. And I, I'm just like, I whack myself over the head for not having really grasped this on my first <laughs> viewing. But last night I was just like, bravo, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's really, really, again, like you said, like the, 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 I am more on the edge of my seat with tension in this 30 second silent moment of two characters sitting together at a dinner table and one of them eating a omelet that's going to make him sick. Yeah. And I think I have been in the last like 10 years of blockbusters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, um, it is, it is so beautiful. And, you know, and again, on the, on, on the one hand, you know, so I, I'm in the process of, of writing my next film mm-hmm. and I, I'm kind of taking a, a class through UCLA to kind of workshop this uh, script. I'm at an outline phase now. I have a couple scenes where it's like inevitably, right? It's like I've got a couple scenes where there's like just a couple characters like sitting at a table or sitting on a stage or somewhere, you know, talking. And in my mind as I'm writing this, I'm like, okay, God, I, I just can't have any of these scenes. I, I've got to have something. But, but then I watch this film. And it's like 90% characters just sitting at a table talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Actually, it's okay. Now, it depends on how it's executed. But it's mm-hmm. not automatically horrible. <laughs> yeah. So I feel well, a little I think better. It's, I think, and it's interesting, too, because, like, again, I, as I said with the, when I was writing Daylight again, um, the first three or four drafts of the script were, were kinetic. They were, there was, like, mm. set pieces. There mm-hmm. was these, like, you know, big jump scares and action and horror and all this stuff. Yeah. And it wasn't until, you know, it wasn't the first time I had seen this, but it was kind of, it had been the first time in a little bit. And I was like really kind of at a dead end in terms of the writing. I was like, I am trying to figure out a way to elevate this. And I watched this and I realized again, like you said, it's, it was ass backwards. So I stripped away all of that stuff. I stripped away all of the like action set pieces and all of that and i was like what it really matters is these characters and how can i how can i tell this exact same story and take the exact same stakes that have existed in these physically violent situations that i wrote and turn them into emotionally violent mm, ones mm. And, and thematically just, and thematically yeah. impactful exactly yes. and completely internalize these things because i find that to be a much more interesting you know, it, it obviously there's there's a play when we just did Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So obviously we're not saying that we don't like, you know, blood and gore and, and that sort of. Well, yeah, you know. I, look, there's space for all kinds of stories yeah, in but cinema. But I yeah, think yeah, that yeah. The, that it does. It It is worth uh, a second if you are a writer or you're a filmmaker or you, you work in any sort of art form to take a step back and wonder, how can I portray this differently? And how can I take these um, these the take the the beats that I have to hit? and internalize them into the characters and have them actually be kind of the embodiments of those themes as opposed to be reacting to, Mm -hmm. you know, exterior elements that are happening. And I think that this movie does that perfectly. I think, like, it it really does. Um, I mean, even just the moment when she makes him dinner and he stops going up the stairs halfway and he's like, I've just got to, you know, I've just got to prepare myself and kind of, like, rubs his temples a little bit. And and then they have this fantastic... uh, conversation at the dinner when they have that fight and you know he's he's completely rejecting her, her attempt at at romance at that traditional romance and saying mm-hmm. you know like what is this like you've you know i feel like i've been dropped behind enemy lines and you're yeah. here to kill me and you know he's of course <laughs> being ab- absurdly dramatic about this situation but i think that that's the way 
that it works. Like, I feel like that's why this movie works so well is because the it's such a heightened performance and all the performances are heightened because Daniel Day-Lewis, of course, you know, seems just absurd in this in so many ways. And, and I don't mean that in a, like, uh, he's difficult to relate to sense. I just mean that, like, his reactions to things are just so hilariously um, emotional. Um, mm. And, but I think that also kind of can sometimes overshadow the fact that Vicky Kripes as Alma is very much childish in a lot of the same ways in mm. that she kind mm. of wants the same level of control um, mm. and that she really, really stands up for herself, not in a like, I'm not going to be told what to do sort of way, well, sort of like that, but also just that she's like not a pushover. She's incredibly strong willed in this. Mm. And yeah. they have this kind of, well, it actually kind of manifests physic or literally this toxic relationship that I think is great because they don't really solve the toxicity there. They just kind of realize that they're almost perfect for each other. Well, I was going to even say, I mean, I was even going to go out on a limb and just ask the question, is it actually toxic in the end? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, yeah. look, or look, are it, they, this, yeah. like, and I'm not going to get into like a literal interpretation. I, I don't interpret stories literally. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is symbolically. So, duh, you don't poison people. That's yes, like, yes. I mean, come on. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so anybody out there listening, it, I, I'm not speaking about this in a literal sense. Of course, you should never poison anyone for any reason. <laughs> but I'm speaking symbolically. I don't think this is actually any kind of representation of a toxic relationship if you look at this symbolically. Again, mm -hmm. from yeah. my perspective, it's about. Uh, the fear of not being in control, and then bringing yourself to a place where you are able to subjugate a part of yourself, open yourself up to vulnerability, and put yourself in the hands of another person. Mm -hmm. That's what I think this is, at least for me, that's what well, I think this is. Well, and that's why I think, yeah, by the end of it, it's, it's a good question. Is it still, like, or is this the perfect kind of, the like, because he even says, you know, I'm, I'm incurable at one point in the movie. He makes that, like, very clear declaration mm -hmm. and it's like well the irony of the film being that his incurability happens to be cured by being poisoned in that sort of sense well, and again I, it's it's all of course i i so my interpretation is actually that he's moved on past that and, and the reason i say that is because um we have this beautiful scene where the image of his mother is in the room with him when he's poisoned and when alma enters the room to check in on him and to take care of him, she disappears. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think we're we have an indication that Alma has replaced the phantom of his mother, mm -hmm. uh, but not not just replaced as in just stepped into that same role, but rather my interpretation is actually that his need for his, that this memory of his mother is actually now gone. Mm -hmm. That he yeah, is I actually, wonder. yeah, and that, that he has actually that he has actually evolving. Um, to it to an to another place in that's an life. interesting way to enter like because i don't yeah i think that that's there's definitely like that's a really i've just never really thought about that way that's a really interesting uh way to look at that because i like the way that i've always seen it um is sort of because it kind of occurs in a moment where like afterwards he does fall back into that kind of uh oh but know. it's different in my opinion, oh, yes. in my yeah, opinion yeah. and, and yeah. Here, here's an indicator, there are a couple, but here's one of the big indicators where I feel like it's different. Mm -hmm. The way we see the change in him through his sister's change. Mm -hmm. okay, so yeah. when they're yeah. sitting at the table and he's complaining, and now for the first time ever, his sister has changed. Mm. Yeah, she says that. It's just that and she says, line. I don't want to hear you whining. <laughs> yeah. This is my interpretation mm -hmm. that it's it's not like, you know, you have this kind of fundamental change and then all of us. I mean, you know, you can have a kind of a like a, a switch can kind of be flipped inside you and you can still exhibit these like vestiges of your old mm -hmm. behavior mm -hmm. and stuff. But I don't know. Just my interpretation is that that whether consciously or not, or I don't know, but PTA is actually using this radical shift in his sister's understanding of him to represent that there is now a fundamental shift yes, in him yeah. as well so I, I i do i do think he has changed no i, I think and, and i think that our, our interpretations i think are actually the same i think i've just never phrased it like that and so i think mm. that's why it's interesting to me to, to mm. hear it from 
your way is just because like I've never really put it in those words. And so well, it's, and it's, my it's way, it's not like there's a right way. I am oh, just no, talking out of my rear end here, man. I mean, I you know, but I think it's, it's the, not just. Uh, I'm not trying to convince anybody that my way of interpreting this film is the yeah, right yeah, way. And yeah. It just it just so happens to be that this is the only one I can speak from because it's and I you know and I think that the the like you know there's there's further proof for that in also the fact that when you know what does he do on New Year's Eve. He yeah. says, "No, I'm staying in. I'm not going but out." What does she he do? leaves, but then he goes and finds but her. But he goes and yeah. and and look at the type of place he's in. He yeah. would never. I mean, you have to understand for somebody who ha- requires such a level of control of their environment to mm-hmm. such a meticulous extent, for him to go to a place like that where yeah. there's total chaos. And what do we see? One of the final shots of the movie is a cut back to that scene when yes. they are dancing alone on yes. the dance floor after like they have they have yeah. persevered through that. So um, I so, yeah. so that's my yeah. take. So I'm choosing to interpret this that that they live, if not happily ever after, at least in love ever after. Mm-hmm. Got a so, steady supply of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so steady no, supply I, of I do. Th- I and I agree. Like I think that when I you know do want to. The, the discussion of toxic relationships not in a uh in a um like a a uh what's the word like a, a critiquing sense or a a mm. like you know it's more just that it's it's this funny thing where i i think kind of to phrase it perhaps slightly differently um that people often look at the imperfections in relationships mm. that they're in and mm they blow them up out of proportion as an excuse to leave that or to get out of it because they're scared um, because exactly because they're scared and people are are afraid of the fact that yeah when you bring another person into your life you are going to change as well that like that is, is inevitable you absolutely there's, there's if no possible if way it can. is a real relationship yeah yeah and and again that and that's what i think is so uh, is also a part of the thematics of this film is that you mm-hmm. know you, you cannot maintain a consistent, meticulous control of your environment and even yourself and yeah. be in a real relationship with a full and, human being. And so that's what I mean. And so that's exactly what I mean when I, I say that the the line of his that where he says I'm incurable and the irony being his hmm. cure being to be poisoned is not hmm. in a literal sense that, you know, his cure is to be poisoned. His cure is to let go of control as he yes. does when he takes that bite right and swallows yeah. so um i do yeah i mean it's like what else well, he, can you chooses, say? <laughs> he, he chooses to, yes. to give up control yes. yeah and, and that that's i think big, it's it's the yeah. choosing that actually is the the key yeah yeah well i mean I, 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 um, go ahead go ahead oh no yeah. i was just gonna say that I, i'd like uh to again bring back that kind of like almost uh mirroring image of 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 paul thomas anderson and Reynolds Woodcock in this in that in that he again is is in control of of all aspects of this film mm-hmm. um that that there's a real autorship but that's why you know I think one of the reasons that I I look at this movie especially the the way that he shot this movie as really 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 um uniquely interesting in that um I always think that it is is fascinating to me and I think it's becoming a lot more common now to see the typical production methods or the hierarchy of production kind of shaken up in a way. Um, you know, mm. they shot this with a very small crew. Mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, again, no credited cinematographer. It mm-hmm. was, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson was kind of steering the ship, but but you hear in that video we mentioned earlier, that Lighting Phantom Thread video, all about the collaboration that mm-hmm. um, they went through to design the look of this film and how... Paul Thomas Anderson was very, in it, in, in it for a small example, very adamant that they weren't going to use LED lights because it was like, he was like, no, it doesn't look, it doesn't have that same feel as mm-hmm. as a, um, like, you know, halogen or uh, the more traditional um, lights used in film. And um, there's quite a bit of flicker in this, though. And he, but he gave, and he gave it up, though. He, he, they actually ever, like, I think, like, most light fixtures in this movie are, are LED yeah. Um, which I think is is interesting, and I mean, again, that's a very small example. Um, but I do think that that's one of the reasons why I love the the making of this film because it it although is incredibly well crafted and incredibly well designed, you can still kind of get this hint of like not improvisation in in a literal sense, but that really wonderful feeling when you like make your first movie um, mm. 
and there's just this like creativity on set of like, well, what if we tried this? What if we tried this? What if we tried this? And so I think that in a strange way, if you look at, at Paul Thomas Anderson's career and, you know, there are people that have worked with him that are, that love him and, and that are very clear about the fact that he is very, very controlling on set in terms of his vision. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you look at this where he, like, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe he didn't relinquish control here in as much of a, of of a sense that, that I'm getting. But when I hear the way that they discuss making the movie, um, I kind of, again, get this very, like an, almost an evolution of how films have been made for the last century. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In, in its in its hierarchical sense, and I think that that's really really fascinating. I mean, hmm. again, the the movie looks fantastic. The, it, it's shot on film. It's it's got a wonderful low contrast look. It's filtered. It's shot on really really old um, glass and things like that. Mm. And I think that that's just it looks beautiful. I mean, yeah. you, you said it was like it, it it took your breath away when you first saw it to yeah. a degree that you were having trouble paying attention to the the, uh, the intricacies right um, it was too can, beautiful <laughs> yeah and i can t- but i can totally totally relate to that like i think that the first thing that that i really stuck to with this movie was the you can the, you can pause and grab that fire extinguisher and put out that flame oh yes you yeah, if you yes yeah. god oh man i've got to it's work okay. as a volunteer we, we firefighter don't, we don't need your house to burn down while we're recording if we <laughs> i'm need dedicated to to I, I can keep talking i can keep talking okay <laughs> all right it looks like you've got the fire out okay yep, okay great. yep no Let's i ran going. off and, and got it yeah um but but no you just get this sense that it, it really was like the film equivalent of like a bespoke dress mm. being made for royalty that mm. that this yeah. is like a a master who has grown beyond and who has learned to perhaps delegate and um because again you you hear about well it's a pretty mike, thought if it mike Bauman. whether it's in reality or not it is a yeah well thought. i mean i yeah. just I just going off of the way that they discuss the uh the creation of the the movie yeah. and uh especially if mike bauman is the as the uh lighting cameraman discussing his role in crafting some of the the uh look of the film i think is really interesting yeah um but no i do i do i mean god i love this movie i, I <laughs> <laughs> it's a, well, i'm it's, speechless we, we almost did like we we almost it's so funny it's like uh i think i've mentioned this before but as we wrap up you know it's like i was talking to someone who listens to our podcast and it's like a a friend like a co-worker of my wife's or mm-hmm. i i think maybe i can't remember where but at, 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 at some point and and they kind of made the joke that like boy you you guys like you don't like you love all the movies that you yeah. talk about yeah. and and i think actually since then we did do um, a few that, yeah, yeah. we did an episode i was it attack of the clones yes yeah that that neither one of <laughs> This actually thought was a good movie. Yeah. So so we did break that streak. I think there's at least there's one film where it's like, you know, both of us had a really hard time thinking of good things to say about it. Yeah, yeah. But interesting conversation nonetheless, anyway. But interesting conversation nonetheless. And, you know, it's like, uh, hey, and the point is not to, to pick films to tear apart. It's to celebrate the aspects of the medium mm-hmm. that, that we love and inspire yeah. us. So Yeah, the, I mean, the only other things that I'll... I'll, I'll like I really want to point out too is just like the score is brilliant. I think Johnny yeah. Greenwood does such a really, really, really fabulous score. Um, and you know, just I listen to this soundtrack a lot. Like I have it on my phone. It's probably one of my top listened albums, honestly. Mm. Um, and the locations also. I mean, I, I just felt the need to mention that in too. It's just that like the actual the the hotel that they go to in the mountains when she kind of walks away up the mountain mm-hmm. in the snow is actually I've been to that exact. Oh okay, wow! Stay there. Very expensive. Okay. But it's a. It's near one of my favorite towns in Switzerland called Vengen, and you. It's uh, Kleine Scheidegg is the actual spot they filmed it. I wonder um, if I went near that. Or it's very was... close to the same spot they shot uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. I definitely been there. I've a hundred percent been there. It's kind of in the like Interlaken, Grindelwald, Vengen. Ben? That, okay. Every, but yeah, uh, the I'll little, have to the take little a look spot at... that they are at is actually called Kleine Scheidegg, which is right okay. below Jungfrau, the big mountain. Um, but I always find that fun because I've been there twice, and every time I oh, there, very I cool. take a picture of the little <laughs> hotel that they uh, they sit they sit at. In the Maybe snow. we can include one of your personal photos in the notes <laughs> section or something. <laughs> and it, you know, and it you do mention Johnny Greenwood, and it I feel uh, I feel you know uh, guilty that we have relegated his mentioning to the end of the podcast and mm-hmm. haven't given it more space. But I agree with you; it is it, it's exceptional. He's scored numerous many of, of pta's films now mm-hmm. 
And it's interesting to see, you know, uh, some of these musicians who were so popular in, in bands at the time when I was younger. So obviously, of course, Johnny Greenwood yeah, was Radiohead. a member of Radiohead. And mm -hmm. then you have like Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails who, with Atticus Finch, I think, who have mm -hmm. done so many of Fincher's films and many other films. Um, and their, their soundtrack work, their scoring is exceptional. So it's very interesting to see these musicians transition later in life to do these wonderful scores. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree, it's fantastic. And I, I have this thought, I, I, I do want to take a listen to it. Um, it might be exceptional music to write to. So oh, I'm it gonna, is. <laughs> I'm going to check it, that out. Uh, I but, speak from experience in agreeing with you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm going to look into that. But uh, well, on that note, uh, what a joy to to have an opportunity and excuse to watch this film again and to get so much more out of it. And I've, I have enjoyed the conversation as I always mm -hmm. do. Colin, thanks for picking such a wonderful film. Um, and thanks for being a part of this discussion. And, and likewise to everybody out there, thank you for listening. Yeah, happy to be here. Have a and, good day. Uh, happy holidays, I guess, depending yes. on when this, or, or maybe you've already, I guess it depends on when this pops It'll out. It'll probably you be the new already year. Had, yeah, yeah. You happy may have new already year. had. <laughs> Uh, uh, happy holiday season and we may be into the new year um, but uh, until next time everyone we'll see you on the flip side mm -hmm.